least try to get the book and read it. I, I think it is one of those uh, books that should be required reading for Christians. It, it is how we are pushed by people and sometimes do things that we shouldn't, but it's, it's an excellent study. All right, um, workday, that's two weeks from yesterday on the 25th, and that will be at 9 o'clock. Uh, Lord willing, we're going to rebuild the play set, uh, and at this point it is usable. We tightened up some of the loose bolts and stuff. It's usable, but uh, long term it needs some work, so we're going to try to do that um, on the 25th. And then family days the 26th, you know the routine for that. October the 2nd is the VCA chicken noodle bake sale, and that's from 4 to 6 o'clock. Um, if you need information about that, you can see either Brenda or Donna. They can give you more information. Uh, on, jo on October the 3rd, we have a missionary, Jonathan Washer. Actually, I don't know if you'd call him a missionary, but he's with a program called Prison Sports Program, programs rather plural. And also on the 3rd, that's DVD Sunday. Uh, we just didn't have enough room to get everything on the bulletin, so... DVD Sunday, and also Communion. That'll all be on October the 3rd. Tenth is our business meeting, quarterly business meeting. We go over the qu quarterly report. Another missionary on the 17th, missionary Chico Pinto to Brazil, and he'll be sharing uh, probably an 11 o'clock service. Then 23rd, next month's work day. 24th, our harvest party. And again, we had that right after uh, church last, last year. And most everybody seemed to like that. If, um, if you have different opinions about it, keep them to yourself. No, I mean, no, let, let me know. If, if enough people, we can move it to the evening. It wouldn't be any problem. Also, I forgot to announce this earlier, but Cindy said that she would be willing to drive the bus to the Johnny Appleseed Festival uh, next week, next Saturday. We used to do this... I don't know about quite a bit, but we've done it before where we have little church outings. So uh, she said she'd be willing to drive the bus. If you're interested in going, I don't know where she's at, but okay. If you're interested in going, just uh, let her know. So if we have uh, more than it will fit on the bus, then we'll, we may have to arrange for uh, extra transportation. All right, I think that's, I'm done with announcing. So Dan's going to come lead us in a song, hymn number 44. Stand if you're able or so inclined.
you're in and they're thinking about this. Uh, somebody before church said, we, we're getting more kids than adults. And I said, yeah, that's great because I can't hardly stand adults. <laughs> but I think that's, I, I'm just joking, of course. But, but uh, maybe my mental capacity. I, I love kids. I, and this is great. Uh, the more kids, the better, folks. Please, this, this is not a museum. Uh, it's about reaching young people, amen? Uh, our, our, the future generation. And um, that's why I was, you know, a while back thinking about a, a, the place. And by the way, I want to mention that there is an account open for that. Hopefully, you can buy two or three years and then save up enough money for a, a play set. But uh, <laughs> I, I think Brenda's about ready to fire me, though. <laughs> if I wasn't a volunteer, she'd already fired me. Uh, Janelle asked me Friday to uh, copy a page of her page so that she wouldn't have to keep flipping back and forth. <laughs> and, uh, oh, guys, it's so fun. Uh, so I got over to the copy machine, and then the devil got a hold of me. <laughs> and so I've read a copy of my hand. And uh, so I took that over to her, and, and I handed her a pace, and I handed her that copy of that hand, and she, she looked at me, and then looked down at her head, and she went, <laughs> 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 And then everybody in the whole learning center lost it. But, uh, I love that. I love hearing kids laughing. Amen? And the good times. I know, I know we're, the learning center is supposed to be library quiet. But not all the time. <laughs> That's fun. All right, now we're going to let them loose um, and see how many bring an offering Penny March time. And we're going to sing 127. Jesus loves you. Of course, I have realized that some of us only Jesus could love, but <laughs> I'm just speaking personally, you know. But uh, that's a good song. I haven't sung that for a while. Thank you, Dan, for leading us in that song. And uh, we often think of that as a song for the children, but you know, it's actually a good song for all of us. You know, it's applicable to even uh, adults who are who are young at heart, I guess. I don't want to say, I, I guess I'd say acting like children. No. Anyway, take a quick look at the offering report for this past uh, week, and we thank the Lord for the good offering there. And Donna, again, wants me to just uh, stress the uh, VCA Christi uh, chicken noodle, <laughs> Christian, Christian noodle, Ch Christian. Christian chickens. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We're only going to be serving born-again chickens. <laughs> I don't know how we get off of things like that. The BCA chicken noodle break, bake, breaks up, bakes. <laughs> it's not working today, folks. I just want you to know that. that I'm only hitting on two cells today up there, uh, 4 to 6 p.m. And if you are interested in bringing something for the bake sale, make sure you see her because it has to pass her inspection. Thank you. Uh, so keep that in mind. The missionary for this week uh, is Benji Lokius, and he's serving in the Philippines. Keep him in your prayer life as well as in 
uh, all of our missionaries. And uh, this week I've been thinking, you know, I, the last year or so, maybe even longer, we, we've been seeing a lot more information out there about the end times uh, theme, you know, where we're, uh, and, and I think a lot of it has to do probably with the fact that uh, we've, we've been going through some difficult times in our country, and uh, and then they got, the, you know, with a pandemic, and then we, uh, we got some, you know, people out of work, financial situations and things like that we had there for a while, and, uh, and so it, it, it causes people to reflect more on that type of a subject. Unfortunately, I think a lot of it's probably more politically motivated than I think any more as, you know, an interest in spiritual things. Uh, in Luke chapter 21, Jesus speaks of the end times uh, of, of life here on earth. And, he, and in the 31st verse of Luke 21, he says, When you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. What sort of things will we see happening? Well, one thing Jesus says that people will try to deceive other people by claiming to be the Messiah. And we know that that's, you know, there's... A, at any given time, there's a, a, a large number of people around the world who claim to be the uh, second coming, or the, I guess the third coming of, the, of, of Jesus. And uh, I, somebody did a study, I think it was in the 90s, that showed that uh, just in the country of Korea, there was about 30 people who claimed to be the Messiah. And I'm thinking, if that, in that small a country, if that's the case, I'm, I have no idea how many there would be uh, in a country such as uh, America, large as uh, our country is. I don't know if you remember this. There was a group of people that met in northern Indiana in the church at some kind of an assembly up there. I think they called it the Glory Barn, uh, something like that. If you remember that? It was the 80s or something. And they all gathered together because their leader had predicted that the Lord was going to return on a specific time. And, of course, they all sold everything they had and they got together. And they all, it ended up with a terrible legal situation. The law was brought in and everything because people were suffering. And, and I don't know whatever happened to it. I, I will probably say this, that they probably were disappointed when it comes to <laughs> the Lord's return. The Bible predicts that uh, wars, earthquakes, and other disasters will be a sign of the end times. And, of course, there are a lot of those things going on today. You know, you see it in the news all the time. Uh, there are also many people who are being persecuted. That's one of the uh, evidences of the end time. Uh, and Second uh, Timothy chapter 3 we read that in the last days, people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy. Uh, and of course, we can readily see that all of these things are happening today. But let's be careful, because all of these things have been happening so, to some degree or another for the last 2,000 years. And so we need to be very careful. Uh, the key, I think, or one key to understanding Jesus' warnings here is found in Luke chapter 21 and verse number 9 where he says, Do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. And then in Mark 13, 32, Jesus says, About that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So what is the point here? The point is, is to be on guard, be alert, be prepared, but be careful. You know, just make sure that what you follow, what you believe, and what you are anticipating uh, and seeing going on is really of the Lord, because a lot of things that's going on in the world today certainly are not of the Lord. And I think as a good steward, what we need to do is be busy about the Lord's business, be uh, occupy till I come, as the scripture says, you know. And so we need to make sure that we are uh, using our resources, investing our resources, investing our time, investing all that we have uh, with the anticipation that Jesus is coming, but with an, also with the knowledge that if he doesn't come uh, immediately right now, and he could, but if he doesn't, then we will be busy about what God has given us to do. And that, of course, is to carry the message of Christ and to be faithful in our, the stewarding of our lives for him. So may the Lord bless us as we think about these things and, 
and don't be sidetracked into a lot of the things you see today that's going on because if you are using America as the barometer of what's going on in the world, you, you, you may be deceived. And, and a lot of times we're seeing political things and what really we need to be watching out for is spiritual things that are or are not going. And so make sure that you are uh, not, in, you know, we've, as Pastor often says, and we've heard it other places as well, we've Americanized Christianity to where we almost see America as the chosen people. Right. And that's not the case. I hate to tell you that. That's not the case. So may the Lord bless you this morning as you give. And uh, certainly the need is great. So we encourage you and, and participate in all these various uh, opportunities for you uh, to give. And the Lord will bless you for it. So fellas, if you come, please, we shall receive our offering at this time. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. What a blessing it is, Lord, just to be able to come to you this morning and to share the Word of God and, and also to just encourage people uh, to be mindful that we are stewards. And whatever time we have here left on earth, help us, Lord, to use it to bring honor and glory to your name. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.
Fantastic. I normally don't do a whole lot of hymnals. Although I love hymnals, I uh, try to do something more new, but I this has been on my heart for a couple weeks. Um, so I encourage anybody that knows this song to sing along to. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save thou art. Thou my best thought by your day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence my life. Thou my wisdom, thou my true word, I ever with thee, thou with me, Lord, thou my great Father, and I thy true Son. Thou in me dwelling, and I with Thee one. Riches I heed not, or man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance, now and always. Thou and thou only, first in my heart. High King of heaven, my treasure thou art. King of heaven, after victory won, may I reach heaven's joys, O oh bright heaven's sun, heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O oh ruler. along with you. <laughs> Didn't know the words that well. That was a good song, though. I appreciate that this morning. Open your Bibles today to Acts chapter 17. We're going to start with verse 23 and 24. We're continuing our study of the subject of worship, and you say, well, you've been talking about that a long time. Well, it's a pretty big God that we worship. In fact, I, you know, I, I don't know how many more in this series, probably 10 or so, uh, but we would just have touched the hem of his garment. And it's not so much that the subject of worship is that great, but the one that we worship is that great. And that's what we, we're at that point now where we're looking at the object of our worship. Acts chapter 17, you remember the background, Paul is on Mars Hills, he's Hill, he's confronting uh, the pagans and their pagan worship of an unknown God. 
And in verse 23, he said, For I passed by, and behold your devotion. I found an altar with this inscription. <clears throat> to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you this morning for your word. And Lord, we know that it is the fullest revelation of yourself. But Lord, we also understand that you revealed yourself in other ways. And and Lord, I, I... Thank you this morning that you have not left yourself without witness. And as we open your word this morning, open our minds, our hearts, uh, our ears, that it might receive, Lord, uh, a, a warm reception into our lives, that, Lord, it might transform us to be more what you would have us to be. And always, Lord, we pray if there's someone here this morning that does not know you in a saving way, that is, that they don't have a relationship with you. Lord, I pray that you would open their ears, their, their minds, their hearts to receive gospel truth today and be saved. And we'll thank you for it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Acceptable worship demands knowing God. If our worship is to be correct, we must worship the right well, in my notes it says things, but better person. It's not enough just to worship something. And that kind of worship, of course, is going on all over the world. Everyone worships something, but not everyone worships the right thing. The only proper place for our worship to be directed is to the one that Paul declared to the Athenian philosophers, the God who made the world and everything in it. As Christians, we take for granted the existence of this creator God, but there, is a lot, there are a lot of people in the world who do not. So the beginning of proper worship must be to address for some the existence of God. We must establish the right foundation before we build the superstructure. The right foundation is the fact that God exists and that he has com communicated to man. In other words, God exists and God is very knowable. Now, in our last message on the sub subject, we stated, or rather started, Morris, it's contagious. <laughs> we started to look at some of the ways that God has revealed himself to man. And we noted that most theologians divide God's revelation of himself into two categories. First, there's what they call the general revelation. And then secondly, special revelation. Now, in our last message, we started to look at God's general revelation of himself. Now, his general revelation would include creation, uh, which we considered in our last message, um, history, conscience, that is our innate awareness of God and reason. So this morning we're going to continue looking at God's general revelation and consider the fact that God has revealed himself in history, conscience, and reason. Let's start with history. History has been correctly called his story. Uh, and indeed it is that. Try as they may, contemporary historian, historians cannot suppress the influence and revelation of God from the pages of history. Now to do so, they do, again, they're like that little child. When you're scolding them, they, they say, eh. you know, they have to suppress the truth. Uh, simply by ignoring it. And you can ignore it, but you cannot remove it. God has been very much active in the history of this world. In fact, the psalmist makes the bold claim that the fortune of kings and empires are in God's hand. Psalm 75, verse 6 and 7. 
exaltation comes neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south, but God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. You believe that this morning? Are you awake this morning? If you believe that, then you have to not have quite as much problem with who's president right now. Oh, my. You're, you done went and said it. The fact is, let me tell you something about um, a president that many of you do not care for. Okay? Can I tell you something? He is God's puppet. That he is there for God's purpose. All right? Now, I'm not going to go into what I think of God's purpose. If you want to know, talk to me after the service. But I, God, the Bible is very plain on this. God exalts and God puts down. God ra raises up people to leadership and he takes people out of leadership, all working his perfect sovereign plan. All right? So we need to maybe have an attitude check at this point. Romans chapter 13, verse 1 says, Let every soul be subject to the higher powers. Listen to this. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. I, I, I just got to say it this morning. Our sovereign God reigns. All right? There, there's no, there are no things outside of his control, including in America our elections. God is doing something. And you say, well, I don't understand that. That's okay. You know, the Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. We don't have to understand everything. We don't have to understand what he's up to. Just understand that he is. He is in absolute sovereign control. Paul declares this in Acts chapter 17, our text this morning, 26 and 27. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. In, in line with this, uh, with the Christian system, we find the, a revelation of God's power and providence. Henry Thyssen said this, uh, God, the Bible speaks of God's dealings with Egypt, Exodus 9, 13 through 17, if you want to check it out, Assyria, uh, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Medo-Persia and Greece together, the four kingdoms that followed up the, the breakup of Alexander's empire and the Roman empire. It shows throughout that righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. It shows also that although God may for his own wise and holy purpose allow a more wicked nation to triumph over a less wicked he will in the end deal more severely with the more wicked and with the less wicked. More particularly, we note that God has revealed himself in particular, and this might be one of the, the strongest apologetics in the world. God has revealed himself through the nation of Israel. In Israel's conception of God and in his dealings with Israel, as with the former, it's been said that it was remarkable that at a time when the whole world um, was following poly polytheism, that is that there are many gods, and pantheism, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants should come to know God as a personal, infinite, holy, self-revealing God, as the creator, the preserver, the governor, of the universe. Not only so, but that they should conceive of man originally created in the image of God as having fallen from this high position and as, as having brought sin, condemnation, and death upon himself and his posterity. And even more than this, that they should apprehend God's purpose of redemption 
through sacrifice of deliverance through the death of a Messiah, of salvation for all nations, of a final reign in righteousness and peace. These are truly, it's been said, wonderful conceptions. They are, however, not due to Israel's, quote, genius for religion, unquote, but rather to the revelation of God to this people, his chosen people. God is represented as personally appearing to the patriarchs, as making himself and his will known in dreams and visions, as communicating his message directly to them, and as revealing his holy character in the Mosaic legislation, the sacrificial system, and the services of the tabernacle and the temple. Then there is God's revelation of himself in history through the nation of Israel itself. In history, although Israel was small and insignificant, and it still is, by the way, by world standards, um, she was the spectacle of the whole world, and again, still is. Uh, the, 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 his, the, 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 uh, we didn't maintain social distance, and I caught it. The history of Israel is one series of miracles after another, including its marvelous resurrection of an, as a nation in the 50s. Surely anyone, again, anyone with an open mind studying the history of the nation of Israel can see the existence and work of God through this tiny nation. And again, even now, it is the center of attention in the world. It can, therefore, be truly said that in all of Israel's experiences, God revealed himself, and that not only to the nation, but through the nation also to the whole world. In fact, Israel's purpose was as the dispensary of God's word, and they should have been the dispensers of God's word, but of course they kept it to themselves. All right, so we see then God reveals himself in history and in particular through the history of the nation of Israel. God has also revealed himself in conscience. Romans chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. For when the Gentiles, and that's simply non-Jewish people, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which shew the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to to my gospel. Man has an innate awareness of God's existence. Now they may deny that, they may suppress it, but God has put it in every individual. This means that he has immediate knowledge of God's existence, yet he does not know God in a personal way, unless of course he has been born again. This innate awareness is derived from man's being created in the image of God. That is, having personhood, man's makeup requires belief in God's existence. For his personhood reflects that of the Creator. Because of this, belief in God is universal as history and uh, anthropology demonstrate. Now, of course, this revelation because it's incomplete, can be suppressed, it can be denied, it can be perverted, and it is, uh, and he can be blinded by Satan so he cannot see what is evident. How many of you as, as, as Christians, you know what I'm talking about, we, we would say, duh, because we, we understand, we've, we've had the illumination of, of the Spirit of God, and it all makes sense now. But to the unbeliever, he's blinded, blinded by his own bias, blinded 
by his own sin and rebellion, blinded by the God of this world so that he cannot see what is evident. And again, it goes back to the same thing that we've been talking about all along, and I'll mention again towards the end of this sermon. What, if concerning the, the, the revelation, of, the special revelation of God in his, in his word, people cannot deny it because of the evidence, because it is plain. They deny it because of their will, because they do not want to submit to God. All right, a last argument in God's general revelation is reason, all right? God also bears continual witness to his existence by means of the world in which man lives and to an extent that all accountable people are without excuse. And that's according to Romans chapter 1, 19 and 20. As people observe nature, they rationally recognize God's existence, though again they may not admit it. Based on this observation, some rational arguments for God's existence follow. First of all, there's the cosmological argument. Now, I know this is a little bit technical, but I, I think we need it. Amen? We need Sometimes we need to eat milk, meat. You can't drink milk all the time. The cosmological argument argues for an event there is a cause According to the cosmological argument, everything in the universe is the result of a sufficient cause that produced it. That cause, of course, is God. Then there's the teleological argument that points to an intelligent cause. This argues for design and purpose that are manifest in creation. We looked at this a little bit last week. Psalm 139, verse 14. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Now again, to someone who is open to the truth and open to the government of God, if you study the human body, you cannot but come to the realization that there had to be intelligent design, that it couldn't just come... To, to be by, by chance. I don't care how many mutations, how many millions of years. It would not happen, all right? Uh, Psalm 19.1, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. So we can look in and see the handiwork of God, and we can look out and see the handiwork of God. All testifying to the existence of God. The design and purpose of the universe point to an intelligent creator who planned and constructed the universe. And, you know, there are just too many things. For example, we're, we're the location of the earth. Uh, I mean, I, we, I, we could talk about this all day. But if the, if the earth was just a few thousand miles farther away from the sun, it would be a block of ice. If it were closer, it would burn up. Isn't it amazing that just by chance we're just the right distance from the sun? What a quinky dink, right? No, all, no. It all points to the existence of an intelligent creator God. Then there's the anthropological argument. The first two arguments deal with the fact that creation declares that there was a cause to creation and that it was an intelligent cause. This third argument deals with the fact that God was also a personal cause behind creation. We're not deists. We don't believe that God made everything and flung it into motion and then took off, all right? But he is very much involved with his creation. That man's makeup points to the creator of a similar makeup, and that similar makeup is personhood. God is like us, or better, we should say, we are like God. But of course, we're not identical, and we are not gods. But in the sense of possessing personhood, the ability to reason and communicate, we share some things with God. Then there's the ontological argument. The ontological argument reasons that since we have a concept of a perfect being, this being must exist. Now, again... 
Let's back the horse up just a minute here, okay? None of these arguments nor these witnesses prove with mathematical certainty that, that God exists, all right? Because we're talking about God's general revelation. So the, none of that proves anything with mathematical certainty. But they do clearly point to a superhuman or beyond human being that we believe to be the creator God. And is there enough evidence to prove his existence? Not necessarily from his general revelation alone. God has told us some things in his general revelation, but not a lot. Uh, we must look to his special revelation to find out who he is and what he is like. And next week, Lord willing, we're going to begin doing that. But I want to close this morning by saying this. God is not dead, right? He's very much alive. In fact, you can't, uh, an internal being doesn't die. That's just silly. God's not dead. He's very much alive and he's very much active and he is very much knowable. You can know him. In fact, excuse me, your eternal destiny depends upon it. Uh, Landon brought this out this morning. We tend to make salvation about not going to hell when you die. And, I, and that is a blessed truth. Uh, going to heaven when we die, that's a blessed truth. But why? It's because we have a relationship with the living God. It's because through Jesus Christ we can be reconciled to him and share in his life. So he to, um, Jesus told the Pharisees in John chapter 5, verse 39 and 40. He says, ye search the scriptures. And the tense there is, ye, are, ye search the scriptures, because that's what they were all about, all right? Bible scholars. Search the scriptures. But notice what Jesus said, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. The Bible is not the end itself. The Bible is a means that takes us to the end. The end is God Almighty, our Creator God. We, we can know Him because of his special revelation that is in the word of God or the Bible. And Jesus said, uh, you will not come to me that you might have life. Now here's the thing, even though, you know, we like talking about apologetics, we like, but you know, base, really in actuality it's for believers. It, it strengthens and builds up our faith. On what I talk about this morning, have been talking about, you're not going to argue anybody into heaven. All right? In fact, no one will come to Christ apart from the help of the Holy Spirit. All right? You, I mean, we're to present the message and even the, the logical arguments. We can do that. But that's about all we do. All right? We're, if you want to think of yourself in, in trying to win people to Christ, we're just God's little messenger boy. We take the message, but we can't convert anyone. That is a special work of God. Now, he, do, he does work in conjunction with his word, so we need to get his word out, particularly the, the gospel message. But no one believes apart from the work of the Spirit. No, and the reason for this is real simple, because of what we've been saying all along. No evidence deals with man's rebellious ways. All right? If they don't want to know, it, it doesn't make any difference what you show them, what you... Listen, Jesus walked the face of the earth and performed miracle after miracle after miracle. And he himself said that those were works that would testify that he came from God. And you know what the Pharisees, the scribes, and many Gentile people did? And they ignored it. And it's because men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Go 
when we talk to people about the Lord, you have, you have to understand we've got to bathe that in prayer because the Spirit of God has to work in their heart and life. Notice Jesus said, but you are not willing. That's the crux of the matter. Now, I want to ask you this morning, closing, if you've ne there's never been a time in your life where you, you've heard the gospel message, the gospel message is that you're a low-down, dirty, rotten, no-good, double-dip sinner. And if I made you mad, you need to get glad. Jesus said he, he didn't come to call the, the healthy repentance, but the sick. Jesus is, the, is salvation to those who acknowledge their lostness. And so don't get mad if I tell you what we all are. We're all no good, low down, double dip sinners. The good news is Jesus loves and saves sinners. He came, walked the face of the earth, lived a perfect life, died for sin, not his because he didn't have any. He died for our sin that if we place our faith in him, a wonderful exchange takes place. He takes his perfect life, clothes us with it, and he takes our sin, puts it on Jesus. Jesus died on the cross for that sin. That's the gospel message. We, we, are, we have to acknowledge our sinfulness, then repent of that, turn from our waywardness, our self-lordship, our going our own way and doing our thing, own thing. Turn back to the creator God who made us and has every right in the world to rule us. That's what repentance is. And then receive the forgiveness of sin through the Lord Jesus Christ. So the question is, are you willing? That's the question. Not, have I convinced you, but are you willing? Are you willing? Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed this morning. Let me just ask you a couple of quick questions, and then we'll have a couple of verses of song this morning. Do you know, do you know for sure? And I, and I want to rephrase this. Normally we'd say that if you were to die right now that you would go to heaven. Well, that's the side benefit. My question is, do you know that you have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ? It, it, it's, not, it's not just I prayed the prayer and now everything's good. The, I, I've said this so many times, I know you're tired of hearing it, but I'm going to say it again. Salvation's not the back door. It's the front door. It, when you get saved, it opens a door to a relationship with a living God. So it's the beginning, not the end. Do you know that you have a relationship with God through Jesus? If, if you know that this morning, as a testimony of his grace, would you hold your hand up to me? All right. God bless you. All right, you may put it down. Uh, again, as far as I can see, and I, all I can go about on is your testimony because I don't know your heart, and this is very much a heart matter. But if you could not or should not raise your hand, would you say, Brother Mike, I, I'm not sure. Pray for me. And I, again, I'll tell you this. I'm not going to come to you. I'm not going to tackle you. I'm not going to get you in the corner. Uh, and I'll pray in such a way nobody will know it's you. But you'd say, I am not sure. Pray for me. Is there somebody like that? All right. Now my question is then, all of your testimony is that you, know, that you have a saving relationship. Are you trying to get to know him better? The most important pursuit in life is not the pursuit of money or fun, games. The most pursuit, important pursuit in life is the pursuit of knowing God. Intimate, intimate. Do you know him intimately? Are you growing? in that way. We're going to have the invitation in a moment, and if you want to, you know, come and pray, I want you to do that. But, you know, understand that the invitation, not going to, it doesn't mean anything if you're not willing to leave and change. You know, that's the bottom line. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the salvation that you provide in Christ. Thank you that we can know you. If, we're, if our, our will is pliable, if we're open to the truth that you reveal to us, then Lord, we can know you in a very intimate way. And we should know you in an intimate way. 
And that intimate knowledge should lead to the right kind of worship. So I pray that you would help us this morning. Uh, if, there's, if there's a lack, point it out, Lord, that we could do business with you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, let's stand. We're going to sing 324. 324. If God spoke in your heart and you want to come pray, give you the opportunity to do that uh, before we leave this morning.